With all the uncertainty, all the volatility, all the cyber attacks, all of the different things that are happening in the world, organizations have started to wonder whether or not they need an exit strategy. So to answer the question, do I need an exit strategy? The answer is absolutely yes. Do you need it now just because of the volatility or because of the cyber attacks? No, you've needed an exit strategy all along. So then naturally, the question is, how do I design an exit strategy? We're going to unpack that today. Hi everyone, this is Eli Kinaser, and today we're going to answer the question, how do I design a public cloud exit strategy? Now, there are two phases when you're considering this type of a strategy. Phase one is the exit assessment. This is what you would do before you even get into any public cloud provider. And this applies primarily to SaaS or software as a service applications, so to speak. And phase two is exit planning. This is what you do once you're on a public cloud provider. How do you then exit that public cloud provider? Let's start with phase one, exit assessment, or as I like to call it, a stress test. Now, why do I call it a stress test? And why does it apply primarily to software as a service? Because there's a lot of niche SaaS applications out there. And for example, a lot of the higher education customers will tend to gravitate towards these SaaS providers. And oftentimes they'll get into a SaaS provider and find out later that well, this is the only SaaS provider in the space. So the idea behind the stress test is to do a lot of due diligence before we even acquire, before we even purchase the service. So what we want to do is once we've decided, once the business has identified an application, the first thing that IT needs to do is identify, well, is there a second player in this space that offers the same capabilities, that meets all of our technical requirements? For example, let's say the organization decides to go with Salesforce. Great. Is there an alternative to Salesforce? If the answer is no, there is no alternative to Salesforce, then we go back to the business and say, listen, you've chosen an application that's going to create some form of lock-in. And because this is a smaller player, there is a potential for this player to go out of business. In this case, it's not going to be Salesforce. Salesforce is too big. But just to give an example of these niche applications and make it a business decision, have the business decide whether or not they want to take on this risk. Depending on how important this application is to the business, they may or may not move forward with this application. If the application does have a second provider, for example, for Salesforce, maybe we've identified Microsoft Dynamics and maybe Microsoft Dynamics meets all of our technical requirements. Great, we're gonna put a checkbox next to that. We've passed the first stress test. Now, the second stress test is, does Microsoft Dynamics have all the tools, the plugins, the capabilities, the partnerships that would allow me to have a smooth exit out of Salesforce and into Dynamics? What we want to measure here is the level of effort it's going to take to exit Salesforce and get it onto Dynamics with little to no interruption to our business. And that is going to be the key here is do they have all of these processes? Do they have the mechanisms? Do they have the support required? And have they done this before? How many times have they done this before? All of this due diligence you want to do before you even select a provider so that at least you can identify all of the hurdles, all of the challenges that you can expect to have with this application before you even make an investment. Now, once you've identified all of these things, it's very important to document all of these things. And you want to do that on a per application basis. So the stress test results have to be documented on a per application basis. And as you're designing your exit strategy, the stress test process that you're doing for this application, the process also has to be documented. It has to be documented as part of your overall cloud strategy. So two things to document. You want to document the results of the stress test, but you also want to document the process that you did so that this process is done for every other application that you plan on using in your environment. Now let's talk about exit planning. Now, remember, exit planning is after you're on a particular cloud provider, how do you create plans to exit that cloud provider? Now, the question here that always comes up is, do we do this based on applications or do we do this based on the cloud provider? And the answer is you're going to do it based on both. Let me explain. So there's the tactical and practical approach 
and there's the strategic approach. The strategic approach we're going to reserve for exiting the cloud provider and what that means. Let's first focus on the tactical and practical that applies to the applications. Now, I know what you're, what you're thinking. Eli, we've got 700 plus applications. Do you expect us to have an exit plan for every one of those applications? The answer is no, of course not. What I would do is I would prioritize the applications. Have an exit strategy, an exit plan for your most important applications. Now, hopefully you've gone through, you've inventoried your applications, you've given your applications some kind of a tiering, some kind of a score that identifies which are your most important applications. And for those most important applications, you create an exit plan. And this is what needs to be also documented in your exit strategy, is the criteria by which you determine whether or not an application needs an exit plan. You can follow RTOs and RPOs. You can go with a business impact analysis, potentially. There's a lot of different ways, and that's the subject for another video, of classifying and tiering your applications. Now, to determine how to exit an application is going to relate to how you've migrated that application. How did you get this application into the cloud? What does it look like on the public cloud provider today? So for example, if you've simply re-hosted the application, you've moved that application from your on-premises environment onto the public cloud, typically that will take the form of either virtual machines, containers, and data, or a mix of. Well, the level of effort for moving that out of a particular cloud provider is relatively easy, right? Relatively straightforward. You're replicating your VMs, you're replicating your containers, you're replicating your data. Bada bing, bada boom, we're off to the races. You've potentially exited this application out of a cloud provider. Now, if you're doing some form of replatforming, when you, when you migrated the application, if you replatformed it, what that means is you've changed certain components. It's still primarily an IaaS application, so it's made up of virtual machines or containers and data, obviously, but you've switched out some things. Maybe instead of moving your load balancer, you're, losing, you're using a load balancer as a service. Maybe you've switched out the database instead of the database being in a virtual machine, you're using a database as a service. So some components have changed. Well, now we have to figure out how easy it would be as, as we're exiting or how difficult it would be as we're exiting a particular cloud provider to swap out those particular services. Relative here. So it's not very easy, but it's not very difficult. There's relative ease or relative difficulty here. Now, if we're re-architecting, if once we move the application, we've re-architected the entire application around a particular platform, maybe you've re-architected, you've redesigned, you've rebuilt this entire application around AWS services. You're using Redshift, you're using DynamoDB, you're using Lambda, you're using all of these proprietary services on AWS, and you've decided as part of your exit strategy, you're going to Microsoft Azure. Now we have to measure the difficulty of moving out of Redshift into, for example, Azure SQL Data Warehouse. This will take us back to the earlier example when we were discussing you know, how we do that stress test exercise for the software as a service, the SaaS application. Does Microsoft have the right tools, the capabilities, the partnerships, the support that would help me move out of a Redshift, for example? How much development work do I have to put onto the Azure platform in order to be able to move that application? All of these things are things that you have to take into account, you have to measure, you have to document in order to assess how difficult it would be to move this application from one provider to another pro provider. And here I'm saying out of AWS to Azure, it could be out of Azure to AWS, it could be out of AWS to Google and vice versa, but for the purposes of example. And then you have, if you've replaced the application. So if you're, you've migrated this application into a SaaS application, then we go back to the earlier example of, well, now we have a SaaS application. Let's look at the alternatives. Let's identify the alternative and identify whether or not there are all of these uh, exercises, these processes that, that can help us exit this application and begin to document them. Now, exiting a cloud provider, on the other hand, is a very strategic decision. That's a decision that is usually made at the executive level. And there's usually some kind of a catalyst that would drive this decision. Well, maybe they're on a golf course and the executive of a particular cloud provider gave them enough incentive, enough support, um, enough branding, enough uh, publicity sometimes 
that becomes a very strategic decision to completely exit a cloud provider. And that's a decision that should never be taken lightly. It's going to be expensive. It's going to be uh, very uh, time consuming and it's going to be operationally challenging. So it should never be taken easily. But we have seen decisions made this way where we're moving from provider A to provider B. But there are other factors that should be taken into account and that should be documented as well. So for example, if there's significant price hikes on one cloud provider where it's unsustainable to even remain on this cloud provider. Typically, the prices are very similar, typically, but it's not on you, it's not uncommon. It's not something that would be, you know, it will never happen. So you would need to document that as part of your exit strategy that should the price hike come in, you know, 25% more, 50% more, then we want to consider an exit out of a particular cloud provider. Now, you could have a cloud provider that's also having significant outages, degradation of service. Maybe the support isn't the same as it used to be. These are all criteria, triggers that merit a conversation. You obviously aren't going to do this if there's one outage or if there's a degradation of service here, but if there's repeated outages, repeated degradation of service, month after month after month, if the support isn't getting better month after month after month, these become catalysts for a potential conversation on exit strategy. And these should happen at a very strategic level with the executives and the necessary players as well. Another factor that can play here is the amount of innovation. So if there's a lack of innovation with a particular cloud provider, then you have a decision to make. You're either going to exit this cloud provider completely, or you're going to augment this cloud provider with a secondary cloud provider, and you become into a multi-cloud multi situation, which to be honest, most customers are going to be in a multi-cloud environment of some sort. That is also the topic for another video we're going to cover multi-cloud at great length, but having a lack of innovation becomes another catalyst, another conversation starter for whether or not you want to have this particular cloud provider be your strategic partner. Now, as you can see, making these decisions is not easy and no one person can shoulder that responsibility on their own. So for these strategic decisions to exit a cloud provider, it has to be a collective. It has to be a team decision. This team has to have representation from the executives, from legal, from procurement, from IT, from the different line of business application owners. They come together and they assess these events. So again, if there are repeated outages, price hikes, degradation of service, lack of support, lack of innovation, all of these are put on the table. They are assessed. The, you know, you're, you're gonna take into account also the level of difficulty to exit a particular cloud provider. The migration is not going to be cheap. There's going to be money that has to be spent to migrate out of a particular cloud provider. How long is it going to take and the potential impact on the business? All of these things have to be decided upon, but this team makes that decision, decides what the triggers are and at what levels, shoulders that responsibility, so they are going to be accountable for this, and then also oversees the project of exiting a particular cloud provider. Now, when you're doing an exit strategy, there is one component that is the king of all components, the most important component of all, and that is timing. How much time do you have so when you're designing an exit strategy or an exit plan for a particular application, it's crucial to identify how much time do you have to exit. Now, the, the time is sometimes set by your regulators. The regulators will impose an exit strategy and will tell you that you have a set amount of time to exit. When you have a set amount of time to exit a cloud provider, that will dictate how you move into a cloud provider, for example. If someone says we've got a year to exit a cloud provider for a particular application, then I would venture to say within a year, you can potentially exit an application out of any cloud provider, regardless of what the architecture of this application is. But if someone says you have a week to exit a particular cloud provider, then my architecture for this application will be significantly different. I am then restricted to containers, to virtual machines and data, something that I can very quickly port out of a cloud provider. So the timing component becomes important. The same thing is true for a cloud provider. If they say, we are going to give you a year to be able to exit a cloud provider, it won't be easy depending on the size, how much applications you have on a cloud provider, 
but we've got some time to work with it, right? But if they say you've got three months to exit a cloud provider, then again, that will impact the architecture of the applications that we deploy on a cloud provider. This is why all of these things are crucial to be had before you even get into a cloud provider. This is what needs to happen, what needs to be documented in your cloud exit strategy, because these decisions will dictate how you migrate, the types of architectures that you're using, how you will exit is all about how you got in. And timing is the most crucial component in an exit strategy. And that's going to be dictated by your regulators and by your executives or by both. So it's crucial to have a timing component in an exit strategy. I hope you found this video very useful with a ton of information. Thank you for watching to the end. If this is the type of content that you like, consider subscribing, helping me grow this channel. Thank you for watching to the end. I love you all and I'll see you in the next one.